Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And many, many thanks to the Texas Aging and Longevity Center and the Center on Aging and Population Sciences for the general sponsor for today's talk. My name is Crystal Ng, and I'm a fourth year graduate student in the HDFS department. I'm so excited to be here today to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Drew Suter. Dr. Suter is a distinguished professor of sociology and a faculty associate of the Center on Aging and the Life Course at Purdue University. Her research focuses on interpersonal relations and well-being, particularly the relationship between parents and adult children and among adult siblings. Her research has been supported by the National Institute on Aging, the National Institute of Mental Health, and, and the Spencer Foundation. Dr. Suter has published more than 120 journal articles and book chapters. She is also a deputy editor in chief of Innovation in Aging and an associate editor of the Journal of Gerontology Social Sciences. Today, Dr. Suter will illustrate the benefit and challenges in conducting mixed models research using the Within Family Differences study as an example which is a study supported by the NIH that she has led since 2001. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Suter. Dr. Suter, please. Thank you. Well, thank you for that well, the invitation and thank you so much for inviting me to come speak today. I was really delighted when I was invited to come speak and then I was even more delighted when someone involved said, well, would you be willing to think about talking about mixed methods? And I think that across my career, I have increasingly become an evangelist for mixed methods. And I was like, yes, now I'm even more excited. So I'm very happy to join you today. And I'm going to start by talking about sort of the way I put it is, I call it how, well, one second, apparently, I, oh, sorry, I'm not sharing yet. No, I am sharing, but it is not letting me switch. Okay, sorry about that. Now it is. It was a little behind. Okay, what I refer to is how mixed methods found me. I sort of fell into mixed methods. And the way I fell into mixed methods was thanks to my mentors at uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Um, my two primary me mentors were Mark Granovetter, who's known for, as you all know, the strength of weak ties, and Rose Lab Kozer, who's known for her theoretical developments in role complexity in the family and, and in medical settings. And when I say those names, I'm sure you don't immediately think, oh yeah, they are the leaders in mixed methods. However, they both use mixed methods for almost everything they did that involved data. And if you read Mark Granovetter's book on the strength of weak ties, you would see it is a beautiful study of mixed methods. And anytime Rose used data, as opposed to entirely talking about theory, she used mixed methods. So, it was kind of what people did at Stony Brook in that era. And so when I did my first study, when I was a third year student, and I spent an entire summer at the New York Academy of Medicine library, uh, looking through home health guides and pregnancy manuals and obstetric textbooks from the 17th through the early 20th century in the United States, I wrote up a mixed methods paper, which was my first publication in 1980. And I didn't refer to it as mixed methods, no one else did either, but it was clearly using quantitative and qualitative data from archival sources. And I just kind of kept going in that direction. Uh, of the 11 studies I've conducted since I did, my, did that first project, 10 of them have been mixed methods. And the way I do mixed methods is what I'm gonna talk about today, but I need to note that this is only one of many ways to use mixed methods. I think because this was what I sort of fell into, probably greatly from Mark and, and Rose's influence, is collecting quantitative and qualitative data from the same people or the same sources at the same time. But this is one of many different ways of applying mixed methods. Uh, people do it with collecting data from Quanti you know, quantitative sample and a separate smaller qualitative sample. They use multiple methods, uh, multiple qualitative methods, multiple quantitative methods. All of these are different ways of doing mixed methods and they all have lots of 
of terrific benefits. So when I talk about the way I do it today, definitely it's not the only way to apply mixed methods. It just happens to be the one that I've applied in my work and that, that I find is I find particularly useful for the kinds of complex family questions that I'm asking and that all of you who are, who are on this today are also thinking about. Um, so why do we use mixed methods? For some reason, every time I try to change it, let me flip over, it does not, there, okay, now it's doing. Sorry, I seem to have some sort of weird lag when I'm trying to change slides. So why use mixed methods? Well, they're, the designs can help you tell a story better by showing the, the processes that underlie these patterns of associations you find using standard quantitative approaches. And trust me, I am someone who adores those standard quantitative approaches. I rarely met a regression coefficient I didn't love, but it just kind of lies there. It doesn't speak for itself very well. And with mixed methods, it's sort of, I see it as giving life to those quantitative findings that you have. It sort of makes your regression coefficients come alive. And it allows you to uncover patterns that are not only not revealed by the quantitative analysis, but sometimes that you have no idea we're there because we all go into studies saying, I think I know what's going on and that's why I find it interesting. I'm going to study it. Um, and then if the, your quantitative findings say what you were hoping you would, you have a nice pretty regression coefficients that make your heart go pitter patter. And you're like, yeah, and so I know that's going on and this is why those regression coefficients are there. But qualitative data help you know whether in fact, yeah, you're right, that coefficient is there for the reasons you thought it would be, or either, gee, that coefficient is great, but the processes underlying it have nothing to do with what you thought was going on, or you get a puny little regression coefficient nobody could love, and you feel very sad because basically you don't think you have any findings. But then you look at qualitative data sometimes and you say, oh my gosh, there is something there. I just didn't, I was looking for the right thing. So they're really, really cool. I see them as kind of fun tools. Okay. Oops. All right. So not surprisingly, I'm going to draw my two examples today from the Within Family Differences study. So let me give you just a little history of the WFDS in case you're not familiar with it. Um, so Carl Pilmer and I began the WFDS in 2001. Uh, when we interviewed 550 older mothers and 750 of their adult children and collected quantitative and qualitative data on every single one of them. Um, now, obviously, the WFDS is having a 20th anniversary this year, and we had a seven-year, our first follow-up, which was a seven-year follow-up, 2008 to 2012, when we interviewed 420 mothers who participated at time one, and those were 86% of the moms who were still alive at, at time two. And at that point, those moms on average were 78 years of age, and we interviewed 833 of their adult children. We obviously picked up some new kids, not new to the families, but new to us, uh, between time one and time two. And at that point, those kids were approximately 50 years of age. So when we refer to those as the kids, these are big kids, these are baby boomer kids. So these are fully fledged adults. And uh, Megan Gilligan and I are thrilled to, to share that actually we are in the field right now for time three, uh, thanks to NIA again. And so we are literally, as we speak, uh, collecting data on the adult children who participate at time one and time two. And we brought a third generation in. We have the adult grandchildren this time. And we are no longer interviewing the moms in good part because more than half of the moms are now deceased since time two. And in fact, the focus primarily of time three it involves bereavement issues. So we are, Megan and I are very excited about this. So it is now third phase as it hits the 20 year anniversary. So the first example I'm gonna share is a study that we published just slightly over two years ago and all my co-authors are there without whom this paper could not have been done, that was on um, studying conflict with mothers during caregiving and looked at whether there were differential costs of that conflict for black and white adult children. So we had two central research questions. And the first was, are 
adult children's depressive symptoms predicted by the conflict that they have with their mothers regarding care during caregiving. As we all know, caregiving is probably the largest literature in social science at this point. But as people who study interpersonal relations and well-being, as I know many people who are watching today do, um, our first sort of go-to is, well, how is well-being affected by the interpersonal relationships? And there's surprisingly little focus on that in the caregiving literature, particularly in terms of adult children and parents regarding care, um, sometimes on pre-existing relationship quality, but what's going on right then and how does that affect those adult children? And second, even though there is a quite a, a large and growing literature on race differences in the experiences of caregivers, there really didn't seem to be anything looking at whether conflict between care recipients and caregivers might differentially affect the psychological well-being of black and white adult children caring for their parents. But we would expect that there might be Oops, jumped ahead. We would expect there might be a difference because we know that on average when we look at the literature, black families, particularly black families in the later year, have stronger norms of cohesion and harmony and support. And so if there is conflict between mothers and their adult children during caregiving, this would seem more counter-normative in black than white families and therefore might have stronger effects on those black adult child caregivers than white adult child caregivers. So our analytic sample for this study was the 279 adult children who were interviewed at time two, who reported that their mothers needed assistance for a chronic health condition or major illness or injury in the past two years. They identified themselves as having provided assistance and the mothers of all the, of the offspring who were in this subsample uh, had been alive and interviewed at time two. So to measure psychological well-being, I'm sure you'll be surprised that we use the CSD, which almost all of us use for one study or another and everyone's familiar with, so I won't describe it in any detail. To measure conflict regarding care, we asked each of the adult children, how often do you and your mother have conflict or arguments about the help you provide her? Very often, fairly often, once in a while or never. And we decided to dichotomize this measure because two thirds of the adult children reported they had no conflict with their moms. And then there was an immediate follow up. I mean, can you tell us a little more about this? And we found that we got a lot of information elicited by this question because, and there were no probes, there was just whatever you wanted to tell us and however long you wanted to take to tell us. So we often heard about the source of the conflict. Um, we heard about how the adult child responded to that conflict. We heard about how they felt. We got lots of examples. Well, let me tell you about when we argue. It's about, and this happens, and then that happened. So we got a lot of really rich qualitative data from that question. So we began by looking to, without looking at race, by race, looking at whether conflict with mother regarded care. And we were looking for nice, as a interpersonal relations and well-being people, we were looking for one of those nice big fat regression coefficients that you can wrap your heart around. And you say, yeah, this really matters. And then we get this puny little thing. Okay? So it's like, well, obviously, conflict with mother regarding care is not doing anything. And as an interpersonal relations person, it's like, boy, this is my radar was really off on this. This should be a this should be the strongest predictor. So what's going on? And as you can see, uh, we're controlling on everything else that we thought might predict depressive symptoms. So what's going on? Well, remember though, we think this might differ by race. So when we look at it by race, wow, do we see a difference? Conflict with mom regarding care is a really strong predictor for black adult children who are caregiving. Not at all for white kids. So something's really going on. Why is it white adult child caregivers, this is not an issue, but such a strong issue for black adult child caregivers. And as you can see, for uh, these not only look big, um, they're the difference between them is statistically significant, the point of one level. So we're talking about a really big difference here. So what explains this? Well, maybe it's differences in the frequency of conflict. Maybe kids in black families are having a lot more conflict with their moms. 
didn't seem to be the case. Their frequency of conflict was almost identical for black and white kids. Oops, and it's doing that thing again. There. But maybe there are differences in the focus of conflict with mothers regarding care. Maybe they're arguing over different things. Okay? And maybe the differences are in the responses of black and white caregivers to conflict with their mothers. So we went back to the qualitative data of that question, can you tell me a little about it? And we found that children in black and white families were almost equally likely to report that conflict was due to mother's resistance to the children's efforts to provide support or to mother's complaints that they needed more care or different care than they were being provided. So, so far again, it looks like, well, things look the same. So why is it affecting these black adult children so differently? Well, what we found when we started looking more carefully was that white adult children often reported being frustrated and impatient with their mothers regarding their resistance and their complaints. And their comments focused more on mother's resistance than they did on the fact that mothers didn't feel their needs were being met. And they were, these adult children were really unhappy about this. Like, why doesn't mom listen to me? So we got comments like, she want, I'm finding I have you all where I can't quite read all of it. There, okay, I moved you a little. She wants to do everything herself, but she really can't. Sometimes she gets tripped up doing things that she doesn't want me to do, and we argue about me doing it instead of her doing it. She's so stubborn, you know. Now, I bolded it, but I bolded it because when we listened to that interview, that's how that adult child said it. Just, she's so stubborn. So it's, it's not, well, we're trying and she wants to do it and I understand she's, you know, she wants to be more independent, but she really needs to let me. No, this child was really, really irritated about this and kind of was like, put this right on mom. You know, she's so stubborn. If she'd only let me do what I want, we'd be fine. This was a common theme. We argue when I try to help my mother do something like cleaning. Like last week I was there and I did the vacuuming. And I said, you, what you could do is wipe down the tables while I vacuum. She comes and grabs a vacuum because she sees me doing the vacuuming. So she, she kind of really gets in the way and that causes conflict. I'll get annoyed because it happens all the time. So again, this edge of real irritation with mom. Now these two happen to be daughters, but we heard it with sons. It wasn't about cleaning, but um, sons would say, you know, mom really wants to cut up her food herself. I keep telling her she needs to let me cut her food for her. If she keeps doing it, she's going to choke or she's going to cut her finger. <laughs> you know, angry with mom that she may choke because she's just not letting me do it. So we saw this, this, this pattern of these white adult children being really sure they knew what mom needed. They knew how it ought to be done. And doggone, if mom would listen to them, things would be fine. So usually when it's people are are not doing things the way you want and you're irritated with them, that doesn't necessarily make you depressed. It just makes you kind of mad and grumpy, which was what we saw. For black adult children, they focus more on conflict emanating from violations of the mother's expectations and preferences regarding how care was provided. And they expect, express concern and often try to explain why they couldn't be more responsive or attempted to reduce the gap between the mother's preferences and the children's provision of care. And none expressed any frustration toward their mother. We didn't hear that at all. So black adult children made comments like, sometimes we fight because I, I can't get there. It's kind of hard because we don't live close to one another and I'm disabled myself, so I can't help her as much as I'd like to. But sometimes we have words. Um, as she identified, this caregiver was, she was disabled herself. Uh, all these families were living in the Boston metropolitan area. Uh, and so she was like 20 some miles away, which going across Boston traffic, that's a lot, that's a lot of travel. And she's unhappy because she says, I can't help her as much as I would like to. So she's trying, she's empathetic. And she feels badly about this, despite the fact she's disabled and also found it very hard to even get to where her mother was. Or she usually likes things done on her schedule, so she has to, but she has to understand 
that things can't always be done exactly when she wants them to be. Sometimes we have to kind of work her needs in with our own. Again, recognizing these needs are legitimate. We're, we're doing the best we can. That's sort of what came through. We're trying really hard. Sometimes it just can't work. We have to work her needs in with what we're doing, but a lot of empathy and no, no irritation with mom about thinking mom needs more. Our, I've got an opinion, maybe a little bit of a learned opinion, so to speak, about whatever issue she's dealing with. So I try to reason with her and try to make her understand another perspective. It's hard for some older people to move away from things they quote, know best, and come around to something that's a little more, you know, current, progressive. So lots of empathy coming out of these adult children. Um, the mothers still aren't happy, it makes the adult children sad that mothers don't always agree with them, mothers sometimes are critical of them, but they're, they see the mother's attempts to remain independent or attempts to have her need made as very legitimate, and they just wish they could do it better. So what is the value added by mixed methods in this example? Well, our quantitative answer is clearly conflict with mom is much more strongly associated with caregivers' depressive symptoms in black than white families. And these findings hold when we control an SES, which those, were, those coefficients you saw were controlling, which is nice because I'm sure everybody on this presentation would, has found times that they initially did runs and said, oh, look, we've got race, race differences. And you say, oh yeah, but we forgot to put in SES. And then when you do, everything goes away. But this one doesn't, it stays that strong. So the quantitative findings were very, they were very sound, we were very excited about them. But without the qualitative data, we couldn't have known that those higher depressive symptoms of black than white caregivers can be explained by differences in adult children's feelings when moms and kids' preferences aren't aligned. And there is pretty much no way I could have envisioned how we might have come up with questions with, that could have captured that ahead of time. We, you know, we certainly thought that it, conflict might be more disruptive in black families because of stronger norms of cohesion and harmony. But who would have expected that white adult kids would disproportionately be saying everything would be just fine if they didn't have those stubborn moms who kept getting in the way. And it's a little hard to figure out how you ask questions of adult children or, you know, on a scale of one to five, how much do you feel that your mother is stubborn and how much do you feel she gets in your way? It's kind of hard to know ahead and it's hard to figure out questions that would really elicit what we really see in terms of these strong feelings of these the strong empathy from the black adult child caregivers and a lot of irritation from these white adult child caregivers. So we think the value added is pretty clear. Now, this is one of those places I told Karen, I would pause between examples in case anyone had questions before I go on to our second example. So Karen, however you want to do it, I'm happy to have people speak or you could read chat, whatever you would like. Um, if people want to post in the chat, I can. Um, I would strongly encourage the grad students, if you'd like to first, if grad students could think of some questions, that'd be great. And you can always do them at the end too, by the way, if you can't think of any quickly enough. Karen, I'll tell you when, or you tell well, me rather when I uh, I, 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 Well, I'll start with a question, Jill. I did yeah. want to let you know, Alice is speaking of us being, we joke that we're twins separated by discipline. Jill's a sociologist, I'm a psychologist. Allison Hyde on my project did do um, a quantitative analysis of stubbornness. And oh. interestingly, um, parents are willing to admit that they are stubborn. They, um, they do, in fact, um, see it themselves, although the offspring see it far more <laughs> than the parents do. But the parents are not um, blind to the fact that they have their own desire to remain the way that the pattern has been in the past. Yes. Um, Okay, we have one who says, um, let me look at this uh, one. Okay, so somebody with your qualitative component, was it just one basic question you were able to analyze? So there's a question about how you analyze the data and what you elicited from participants. And how we do it depends on what we're looking at. And in this case, we, we were particularly focused on how respondents, uh, what they said in response to that particular question. But one of the nice things about the way that, uh, or about my good fortune of being able to support several graduate students and undergraduate students to transcribe each and every interview is that we could look through the entire transcript of the interview and look for whether there were other instances when we weren't actually asking them about conflict with their mom. But for example, when we 
even ask questions like how often do you see your mom? Uh, you know, how often do you talk to her on the phone? That sometimes people would say, well, um, well, I talk to my mom four times a week. She still complains though, that I'm just not doing enough for her. Or I talk to her four times a week, but I still worry about her a lot. I wish I could do more. So we're able to look through the entire transcripts of these like one and a half hour interviews. Um, these are not short interviews and look through them and see whether these issues come up in other contexts as well. So we almost always focus initially on that question that we know is most relevant. And then we, we comb through the entire interviews to see, is there anything we're missing? Um, Jill, this, we're getting some terrific, thanks for the answer, that we're getting some terrific comments from the grad students. They're also complimentary of your talk. But here's a couple more. Did any of the children offer um, and say that the parents were cr criticizing them? And also, do you think attachment style would matter in your findings? And if so, how? Um, okay, the first of those is easier than the second. Um, this is the difference between being a psychologist and a sociologist of how much we think about attachment. Um, yes, we did find very often that, that adult children would say that, they're, that they were criticized by their mothers for not providing enough care, not providing care when it was needed, not doing it exactly the way the mom wanted. Um, and again, this was in both black and white families, but differences in how the children felt about that and responded to it. Um, we, we actually don't have a measure of attachment. We did have it at time one and um, I, I, we never used it. And at time two, when we had so many more questions to ask and um, the person we were working with at UMass Boston, who collected all of our data, said, you know, you just got to cut something. How much did you use that item, that scale? And we said, well, we actually didn't. So we have our general sense that there is a difference in attachment and that that difference also differs by race, but we can't, we can't quantify it using the attachment. Well, I guess in theory, we could go back to those moms um, whom we asked it of, or our kids who were only at time one, but we haven't done that. But that's a really interesting question. I always wish we could put more questions in, and it seems like our people at UMass are always really good at knowing how to say, how much do you really need that? How much did you already use that? And unfortunately, that's when we dropped. That's a really great point, Jill, about research design is, um, yeah, just the limits. Uh, there'll always be something missing. Okay, so I have a couple more questions for you, and they're about race. So they want to know if you um, could look at the racial differences in criticism, but related to that, there are questions about um, how you use the qualitative methods for looking at racial differences. So if you were looking for racial differences, how did you approach analyzing the qualitative data? Did you go through the responses of the black families and then the white families, or how did you sort of do the process? And then the finding about criticism, if you could address that. Okay, all right, sure. And actually, let me respond to something Karen just said also about the, the design issues. The person who helped us design both time one and time two had actually worked with Alice and Peter Rossi on their study of intergenerational relations because these, uh, Center for Survey Research at UMass had also collected all the Rossi and Rossi data. And so she had gotten very good with the Rossis who were very outspoken people and had strong, strong minds of saying to them, no, you can't have that. You already have too many items. So by the time they got to us, um, they were like really, really clever at figuring out how to talk you out of having an item on there. Um, we do, basically, we, we do have having from coding that qualitative data, we do have rates of moms criticizing the adult children, and that seemed to be very similar by race. And what we do, whether we're looking at, and this is, is relevant for the next example on widowhood as well, that whether, whatever our moderators are, and we, we love moderators, um, what we do, I'm very old school about this. It's, it's how I'm sure I'll do qualitative data my entire life and how I teach my students that this is what I see as the best way to get to know your data, is literally, we it used to be on, on, on three by five cards, now we're beyond that, but everything is on in word, word tables. And we actually rearrange them. So you've got side by side, comments from black adult children, comments from white adult children, and go back and forth. You can go through all, and we do, I go through all of the, kids in black families that I color code, you know, okay, well, this comment is, these comments are all in turquoise and these are in pink, do the same for the, for the white families. So we literally move these 
word table, move the columns and the rows in these word tables around to be able to literally look at it very much like the old days when you used to use three by five cards and put your notes on them. And now we do it electronically, but it's literally doing it with human eyes rather than doing it all mechanically. It's not searching for keywords. It's literally doing it very holistically, looking at these cases. And we usually have a column that is, or a, a cell that's for, what were their responses to this question? But on the right, there's always a column that is, what else is relevant? And so any, whenever I have students putting these together for, for them to digest and then me to digest, we get lots of things from other items that they put in that last far right cell about those families that is relevant. I hope that answered that question. That was terrific and really, really wonderful questions. And so- yes, Very um, good questions. I appreciate all of them immensely. Yeah, and um, what I'm gonna suggest is that we go on to the, let Jill go on to the next example, but certainly as you think of things, go ahead and post them in the chat and then I can sort of post them to her at the end. So please don't hesitate to put in the chat. Yes, um, absolutely. Okay, so our second example is like hot off the presses. We just finished this paper five weeks ago and have it under review. I'm probably afraid every reviewer on it is probably sitting in on this call. Um, but we decided anyway that we would use it because we think it provides, uh, well, we're also excited. Or you're always excited when you finish a paper at long last. And we think this is a really nice example of what you can learn from mixed methods that you can't learn from, but we feel from either one alone. And so this paper builds on the 20 years that we've been looking at what are the conditions under which mom's favoritism or dads, but we have very few dads because they tend to die younger and all that, but particularly moms, what are the conditions under which mom's favoritism and disfavoritism or your perceptions of it affect your well-being? And we all know that it seems like no matter what your age, what the, you know, whether you're looking at people who are married, single, whatever you're looking at, being disfavored by mom makes people unhappy. That's not a big surprise. Who wants to be the kid mom is most disappointed in or most angry at or both? But we kept finding much more at time two than at time one that being mom's favorite, being the one she was most emotionally close to, increased depressive symptoms. Now, why is that? Who doesn't want to be the kid mom loves most? Well, it seems like maybe it comes at a cost. We knew part of that cost was that when you perceive that you are the kid mom is most close to, you have a lot more conflict with your siblings. And in fact, a paper we recently published that Sion Peng took leadership on um, showed how a fair amount of the effect, or at least some effect of uh, perceiving mom favors you affects your psychological well-being because it increases that sib tension. So definitely it's mediated through sib tension. But we also found that doesn't explain all of it by any means. There just seem to be real direct effects of feeling that you are mom's most emotionally close kid. And more so at time two than time one. So we started thinking, well, what are these conditions under which it matters most? And so we thought, well, one of the things we should maybe look at is maybe mom's marital status. We looked at mom's age. Age didn't make any difference. So it isn't just moms are getting older. So is there something else going on? So we said, well, maybe it's mom's marital status. So our first research question is, was, does mom's marital status shape the impact of maternal favoritism on adult children's depressive symptoms? Now, why might we think that it does? In particular, why would children of widowed mothers be more likely to be impacted by perceptions of favoritism. Well, if one thinks of this the way that Laura Carstensen would, and um, basically around here, we always sort of first think, well, what would Laura Carstensen think of this? She would say, well, when you think of socio-emotional selectivity theory, the loss of one parent would heighten the children's recognition that their time with their surviving parent is finite and increase the salience of that tie, particularly for offspring who are especially close to their mothers. And especially when you consider this is a difficult time for mothers when, they, when they're widowed. They've lost their primary source of support. Um, if they're at the age where they're losing it, they may have lost friends. They may even have to move out of a house they've been in for 60 years they wanted to stay in. So maybe knowing your time is finite and mom is having a harder time, you would feel like this is really you want, this is time you want to be closer. When you're close to her, those things really bother you. So maybe just the fact she's widowed. But mother's widowhood, also thinking of this from a socio-emotional selectivity perspective, mother's widowhood 
my fuel favored children in particular to have a sense of urgency to enact the role of emotional caregiver at the point when their mothers have lost their most central source of support. And they may feel, well, here's this sort of this void now. And I'm mom's most favorite kid. She's the, I'm the one she's closest to. I need to step up and try to sort of fill that void that's there because mom is widowed. And particularly for daughters, this might be an issue because as we know, women are socialized throughout the life course to be the ones who are caregivers. They're the ones who think about interpersonal relations and want to take care of people. And if they were especially close to mom, they would especially feel, I need to try to make things okay for mom. And that would be psychologically very stressful because it is really hard to make things okay for mom. Mom is, mom is well into her, her 80s. She's having, you know, she may be having health problems. She's, she's widowed. She may have lost friends. It's a really hard time to make things okay for mom. So maybe this would particularly be difficult for the well-being of daughters who would feel they should be the emotional caregivers at a really hard time which led us to having our second central research question, which was, are there gender differences in the extent to which mother's marital status moderates the association between perceived favoritism and adult children's psychological well-being? So our analytic sample for this study was the 641 adult children nested in 273 families in which there were at least two living adult siblings. After all, we're saying favoritism, you have to have somebody else, some other sibling there. And Mother was alive at the time of the interview of the adult child, and that mothers were married or widowed at time two, not divorced. Um, this is because number one, that group was smaller, but also bear in mind, we started studying these moms when they on average were 70. And so these are not the baby boomers who got divorced a lot. This is the older generation who got divorced much less. And most of the women who had been divorced were divorced 30 or 40 years before the study began. So they'd been divorced in their 20s and we're starting to interview them in their 70s. So we felt that we just better to take them out of the picture and they're a small group anyway. So again, we use the CESD to measure psychological well-being and to measure children's perceptions of maternal favoritism, we asked to which child in your family is your mother the most emotionally close? And we followed up with, why did you choose yourself? Or if you, if you chose your sister, Karen, why did you choose Karen? And each child was classified into one of two categories. Either that he or she had named him or herself, which is about a third of the kids, or that they had named a sibling or reported mom didn't favor anyone. Now, the reason that we use these two categories is we found repeatedly that when it comes to favoritism and disfavoritism, it's all about you. It's not, do you think that your mom really favored your brother, Jeremy? Eh, doesn't make any difference in your psychological well-being. The issue is, does mom favor or disfavor you? So that's why we uh, transform the variable this way. So we started by just double checking to be sure that this analytic sample looked like everything else seems to in our data, that yes, in fact, reporting yourself as being the child to whom mom is most emotionally close is associated with your having higher depressive symptoms. So a regression coefficient we can all love. And again, it's controlling on everything we found is relevant. Um, needless to say in our papers, we have much more elaborate tables, but I kind of believe that in presentations, it's nice people have a chance of seeing what you're really trying to talk about. So in presentations, I always use these uh, little smaller tables that just have what's important in there. Okay, so, so far, this looks like maybe there, maybe this is the same for everyone. But look what happens when we look by mother's marital status and child's gender. If we start on the left, we see that those are not regression coefficients you can get your heart around. There is basically no impact of perceiving that you are mom's closest child on your CSD scores if mom is married. And it's the same for sons and daughters. So nothing if mom's married and nothing by gender if mom's married. But look at what we see on the right. We get a large difference that, again, that difference is statistically significant. We have a really clear impact of perceived favoritism for daughters relative to sons, but only daughters whose moms are widowed. So why are daughters but not sons depressive symptoms 
affected by perceptions of maternal favoritism when mothers are widowed. Um, might there be differences in the meaning sons and daughters give to being favored by their widowed mothers? And in particular, might favored daughters be more likely than favored sons to see themselves in the role of emotional caregiver to their widowed mothers? So when we began to look at daughters' explanations for being the children to whom their mothers were most emotionally close, we found that about half of the, those daughters describe themselves as mom's emotional caregivers. Because when she's in emotional distress in particular, or happiness, she'll confide those things to me. Whoops. I'm always there for her. You know, if I don't call her, she calls me because she's worried and that kind of stuff. I'm the one whose shoulder she cries on, no one else. And this was also a big point because for a third of these daughters, they were the sole emotional caregiver. She doesn't talk to my siblings about this. She'd never say this to my brother. My sisters have no idea. Mom only comes to me. So they're emotional caregivers and they're sole, sole emotional caregivers. And they didn't, there weren't hesitation. They just like right there threw that out. When we looked at the sons, this was a whole different experience. Um, only 20% of the sons who named themselves as most emotionally close to mom, only 20% of them said anything about providing emotional care or, or emotional support to mom. And when you see what they said, you won't even be quite sure if they did that. We were like, okay, well, we need to, we can't just say, no, none of these sons did this, but boy, it, it looks different. So for example, emotionally close. Um, by the way, we had no ums from the daughters. We had lots of ums from the sons, lots of long pauses. Emotionally close? Hmm, I'm really not sure. I guess it depends on the circumstances. Well, I could say myself, you know, if someone my mother knows dies, a lot of times she'll call me first. Emotionally closer? Hmm, emotionally close. And then we got really long pause here. Maybe me? I don't know. I don't know. I just... I don't know. Even though this son had just identified himself as the one to whom his mother was the most emotionally close. This is responses to the follow-up question. Or, um, I'm not sure about this one, but I can feel. I'm not sure why, but, but, it, I mean, basically, but it's there. In fact, a third of the sons couldn't come up with any explanation as to why they were most, emo why their moms are most emotionally close to them. And these are about as warm and fuzzy as we could find. So this, clearly these sons are not seeing mom's widowhood as an opportunity to like step right up there and be an emotional caregiver. They're not even sure they've stepped up. It's like, oh, I've stepped up. Maybe I have it. I don't know. Is it me? I don't know. Maybe it's some of the others. They say, well, yeah, it's me. And they say, well, I don't know. I thought it was me. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's my sister care. No, I think it's me. And then we'd say, why? And they say, I don't know. I just, I just know it is. So a very different um, sense of embracing the role of emotional caregiver. So in this case, the value added by mixed methods, well, perceiving oneself as a child who mother was most emotionally close was clearly only a strong predictor among daughters of widowed mothers. So that isn't, we feel, an important finding, but the qualitative data gave us a really clear sense of what's going on. It's daughters, but not sons, um, who see themselves as being emotional caregivers, particularly solo caregivers, at a time when mothers are particularly vulnerable, and this takes a, a toll on those daughters. So is the, is the value added by mixed methods worth the cost? Well, hopefully, I've sort of convinced you, there are clearly positive sides of using mixed methods they can shed completely new light on family processes that you just had no idea were there. And they, they sort of are like a, a nice sort of safety net of backing up and confirming what you think is going on. On the other hand, they also question your understanding. So when you look at the qualitative data, you have to say sometimes, hmm, that's not what I thought. Or especially when you get that, you know, we see a little tiny regression coefficient that breaks your heart. You're like, why is it just maybe I, 
<laughs> did I not code that variable right? Is there, do I need another control in? And you look at the qualitative data and you say, no, basically what I thought mattered just doesn't matter at all. So it's a, a nice check on yourself that you really, whether you, you really do seem to have an idea of what's going on. But there are clearly challenges to using mixed methods. And one of the greatest is money and human hours. There is no question that there is a lot of time. And if you have funding, when I look at my budgets, each time they break down the same way. 40% for data collection, even though it's pretty pricey too, but 40% for data collection for all of these semi-structured hour and a half log interviews, but 50% for hiring RAs, graduate students and undergraduate students who listen to every minute of a tape, every minute of recording and transcribe all of it and think about it. And in my case, we have either one or two, two and a half hour meetings every single week. And they bring questions. Well, I think this means this and we should code this this way. I wasn't sure, what do you think? And everyone discusses it till we agree, yeah, this is how it should be coded. Of the more than 60 papers that we published from the WFDS, somewhere between a, a third and half of them were generated from the discussions I had with the students each week. Um, birth orders become a big part of the study. Certainly never thought of birth order when I wrote the proposal for the WFDS one, but the students came to me and kept saying in our meetings, I keep finding moms talk about their babies all the time. Do you find that too? So a lot of the ideas that we have come from a combination of the qualitative data, but having those human beings there listening to those recordings, transcribing them, thinking about them, bringing their questions, bringing their ideas. I think I've seen this, as anybody else seeing this, um, in ways that you can't get from sort of mechanical transcribing. Because no matter how hard you try, it's not going to be quite the same as having real human beings listening and taking notes and asking questions. Um, so there's a cost, money cost, there's a human hours cost. Um, some of that cost can be reduced if you find a public use quantitative data set and you can use it for your quantitative component and then you do a smaller qualitative study yourself. Now you have two of the, you know, people, two of the people you have probably right here right now who are experts at this. Karen Fingerman is you know, terrific with qualitative data. I remember reading her dissertation a long time ago, which was qualitative. It's excellent qualitative work. She's really good at doing, you know, putting these together. Deb Umberson is a rock star on taking large surveys and then is collecting smaller qualitative samples. She has, if you have not read her, if you're interested in mixed methods and you have not read Deb's book on uh, parental loss, you should read it. It is a beautiful example of mixed methods on family topics. So you can cut down the cost if you can find a large survey or actually one of the, Megan and I um, wrote a chapter for the source book on family theories and methodologies that's coming out in 20, the end of this year. And we highlight several different examples in there in, in great detail, Debs is one of them. And uh, someone who was interested in studying court processes and custody cases, they, they had quantitative data from open court documents. And then they actually hung out the courthouse and they interviewed people before and after their court hearings to get their qualitative data. And the two of them just did it themselves. So um, you can do it less extensively. It's the most expensive if you're trying to do big scale surveys and collect all the data, the qualitative data concurrently, which is what we like to do. Um, it's also done best with teams. And remember to dyad as a team. You don't have to have 12 people. It may be easier if you do, although I find six actually. Six to seven seems to be ideal. 12 is a little much. But you can do it very well with two people. You can do it yourself. I did my dissertation that way. I interviewed 60 women and their husbands twice in two years. And these are each three hour interviews. And then I spent three hours sitting and transcribing and coding nonstop. Um, but I could do it. But I actually think I would have done a better job if I had a partner to do it with. So dyads are all you need, but teams really help with, with mixed methods research. And there is a greater lag following data collection. 
you are not going to be publishing your first paper from a mixed methods study six months after your last interview. Um, no matter how hard you work at it, and actually at, at the WFDS3, we are closer to being on track with when the interviews are, the data are being collected than I have been in any study I've ever led before. But we're still probably a month and a half or two behind where the interviewers are. Um, but that's, but there's always that lag. So these are not fast studies, but you get to have an intimacy with your data in a mixed method study that you can't get by just having quantitative data. And again, I love quantitative data. It is, I have many of my most fun days are running tons and tons of MLM models. It is lots of, but again, those, re, those regression coefficients just kind of sit there on the page and your qualitative data really jump out at you. So I think this is, you know, I have certainly been convinced from my work, I can't imagine doing otherwise. And uh, I hope you will consider, especially since you have such amazing mentors there at UT Austin who are so good at this, who can um, help you get started in using mixed methods because they are really artful at this. Uh, not that I'm sure Deb or Karen were looking for me to, to have 50 other students come to them uh, to try to mentor them on mixed methods, but you have some really extraordinary people who do this right, right within five minutes of you. So that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. A big thank you to NIH, without which this work would not be done. NIH, NIA specifically, has supported this project throughout. Uh, Purdue has been very good at those times that, uh, unlike some of you who never have, never seem to have a break between grants, uh, unfortunately, many of us also find sometimes there are breaks when we aren't funded. Purdue has been very good at bridge funding, and the Center on Aging and Life course has always helped me by uh, giving me some course release time so I could spend more time with my data. And thank you also to my entire project team whose names are up there. Without whom nothing would get done. They basically are who run the shop. Um, I just sort of sit there, and they're the ones who do all the work. And um, so a huge thank you to each and every one of them. So I will stop. I haven't even checked my time. To, don't tell me I'm 10 minutes over already. We have time for um, maybe a question or so, if, if somebody has one. What software do you prefer for analyzing qualitative data? Uh, that is a, that's a hard question for me because I don't use any. I, I just don't, I personally don't, I feel like it puts, for me, it would put more, it would not, I have to get really close to the data, literally be reading all the, tra the transcripts to do the kind of analyses that we do. For me, I feel like I have, I thought a long time about making a switch and I was like, this would take me away from the sort of holistic approach that I try to use to it. Um, I do pull out, so I will, I will select particular cases. I mean, I'll select, all right, I want cases that have this, this, and this characteristic. Mom is widowed, uh, widowed daughters, widows, and pull them out. And then we actually pull those transcripts and organize them into tables. But I have never felt that there was a qualitative software that I felt would, that would keep me as close to the data as I feel by using these um, kind of standard classic ethnographic approaches. Um, so we are getting a little bit short of time in that um, one thing I did want to ask, uh, so just so you know, I should really thank the graduate students from the Texas Aging and Longevity Center. This talk was initially initiated and in fact they wrote a grant to um, be able to uh, sponsor the talk. And so a huge shout out to the Graduate Student Council from TALC. And um, yes, yay. Um, but I also, um, before I wrap up, I did want to ask Crystal, I know that y'all are having a graduate student meeting with Jill around 1.15. Can you tell the graduate students how to, you know, get to that meeting or put it in the chat or something? Yeah, I can put the link in the chat. It starts at 1.15. So if you have more questions or want to have a more personal um, discussion with Dr. Sutter, you are welcome to join. Yeah, we, we absolutely please do. And Jill, is is one fifteen still okay with you? Do you need oh, a little perfect. more? Okay, one fifteen is then when the graduate students will be doing it. 
I did want to say, because Jill raised it, um, Jill was the first person to cite my work ever. And I remember it, and I will remember it my whole life. So you should try to cite junior scholars, because it has the kind of impact where, like, on their deathbed, they're going to be thinking about you. Thank goodness for so-and-so, they cited me initially. Anyways, or at least when you retire. So, um, so anyways, I, I wanted to um, thank Jill for that, and also thank... Well, and it's very hard not to continue citing Karen's work because I think half of the work that that's done in the entire field is Karen and her group. So oh, well, you were you were very kind, and then uh, but I followed Jill. I followed Jill my whole career. So I want to thank you for that really, really interesting, very illuminating, just terrific talk. And I hope everyone will join me in uh, um, in thanking Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for having me.